Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's NAC at Home program. My name is Nadine Heidinger and I'm the Director of Communications at the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, we offer over 150 free events to the public, including exhibitions, musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org, or you can visit us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Today, we're joined by Stephen Greenblatt, the Kogan University Professor of the Humanities at Harvard University. Stephen is the author of The Rise and Fall of Adam and Eve, The Story That Created Us, and Tyrant, Shakespeare on Politics, um, among many other books. We're also joined by NAC member and founder and president of the Shakespeare Guild, John Andrews. And without further ado, let me pass it on to John. Enjoy the program. Thank you, Nadine. Uh, Stephen, I think uh, we left off, what, about a dozen books in addition to the ones that he didn't mention. And, um, Counting. And uh, among other things, for those of you who may not be completely familiar with Stephen's work, he is the general editor of the, um, uh, the Norton Anthology of Literature. He is also the editor of the Norton Shakespeare uh, volume, the works, uh, which I think is probably the best-selling volume of the complete works available. Am I correct about that? Uh, it's, I think it is actually. It seems, yes. it seems to be. I'll hold it up. All right, there we go. And uh, he is the author of, of uh, numerous books, among them The Swerve, which I will hold up. Uh, this, this is a book that won both the uh, Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. And it's one of the dozens of honors that uh, Stephen has. So it's a great pleasure to have an opportunity to talk with, uh, with Stephen. The, the book I'm most interested in talking about is called Tyrant. And this came out, what, about a year ago, Stephen? Am I correct about that? That's right. I think so. Or a year, well, maybe, maybe it was a little more than that. A year, year and a half ago. Yes. And it was preceded by a remarkable uh, piece in the New York Times, uh, which came out, I believe it was in October of 2016. Yes, that's and, right. And, and, uh, and it was uh, a warning that we should not take the election of 2016 for granted. I think there were about three other people who saw as you did that there was a risk involved. Michael Moore was one, um, uh, Alan Lichtman, and uh, I think Bill Maher, am I correct? He also had some concerns uh, ahead of the election, but most people I think at that time were assuming that, uh, uh, that it was going to be a, um, a route for Hillary Clinton. And, uh, and it turned out that uh, uh, those projections were wrong. What I found most interesting about your piece, Stephen, was that it was all about Shakespeare and all about King, about uh, uh, Richard III in particular. And there was no mention of the candidate that you were concerned about. And I was also amused when I saw Tyrant. And again, it's all about the the works of Shakespeare and what they teach us about uh, politics but once again there was no mention of the person that most people would be thinking about when they saw that so I thought it was a brilliant uh, piece of indirection on your part and that you were doing something that uh, you credit Shakespeare with doing which is to find oblique angles for looking at uh, political situations. Am I correct that that was all by design? It, it, it was rather by design, though, of course, uh, in addition to uh, a, uh, a difference, a, want, a lack of genius on my part and a abundance of genius on Shakespeare's part, 
uh, there are also differences in the circumstances. Shakespeare had to be oblique. Right. Uh, Shakespeare was writing his plays in effect in North Korea uh, or Iran. Uh, right. The, yes. the, or, or uh, the German Democratic Republic. Uh, right. The, uh, that is, say, a world of, of uh, ruthless uh, oppression, uh, com almost complete absence of free speech. So you couldn't address anything in contemporary, in the contemporary world. If I wanted to shout the name of a particular politician that I uh, disliked from the rooftops, nothing uh, would happen unless I fell off the roof. Uh, but no one would, would, would worry about it. We don't have that, mercifully, we don't have that uh, situation. But I wanted to explore and to tap into the power of, of uh, an oblique angle, which is Shakespeare's genius, they say, mm -hmm. to some extent, uh, compelled by the circumstances of his time, but not only that, uh, he figured out, as his whole world figured out, how to think deeply about uh, politics, power, character, uh, not by addressing the immediate circumstances of their lives, which they couldn't do politically, but by thinking about larger patterns, about things that happened again and again. And of course, it wasn't only a particular politician in America that I was even then uh, thinking about, but about uh, people with names like Putin and Orban and Duterte and mm -hmm. Bolsonaro, right. you could go on and on. I mean, we are living in a moment in which there is a resurgence of a certain kind of personality type and a, per, a certain form of rule uh, that seemed to be shrinking, but now is uh, growing again. And Shakespeare yes. understood that form of rule very, very, very deeply. Yes, yes. And, um, and I, what I thought was particularly interesting was how you talk not only about the man who wants to seize total power, but about the people who surround him and how they behave. And I wonder if you would like to say a little bit about that. Yes. You know, uh, it's not clear that Shakespeare knew this work. He might have. Uh, but Montaigne's uh, great intimate friend, Etienne de la Boissy, uh, wrote a work called uh, Against Tyranny. I mean, the contra un, against one. Uh, can, and in that work, he was worrying about how he would stop the rise of a tyrant. And he argued, uh, how should we say, in a kind of uh, Gandhian way, you don't need violence. Uh, you just, when he orders you to do something, don't do it. Uh, why don't people simply say no when someone tells them to do something that is obviously... Uh, cruel, wicked, inappropriate, uh, destructive, and so forth. And he wondered why, that sh why it was that people wouldn't simply say no. That's what his fantasy was, that when the tyrant tells you to bring him his coffee, you don't bring him his coffee. You just walk away. So yes. why would people do that? And he said that it's because all the tyrant needs is uh, 10 very powerful people who feel that they can profit from the tyrant's rule. And then those 10 people have 10 people, each of them below them, or 100 people below them. And they, each of those have more people who think they can profit from this. And eventually, you get a kind of gigantic, from one person at the very top, you get an enormous pyramid of dependence in which right. people are willing to go along with things that, in some sense, they know yes. are terrible ideas. Now, Shakespeare, as they say, didn't, may not have read this work. Uh, and probably didn't need to read it. Uh, he could look around and see mm -hmm. how it was possible for uh, grotesque, inappropriate people to uh, rule. I don't mean only rule nationally. I don't think Shakespeare had to be in his bonnet uh, about Queen Elizabeth, uh, but how his whole hierarchical system functioned. Right. And he thought that there were enablers. Uh, and he th thought, because Shakespeare thought in terms of characters, he gives them names, they're, they're characters in plays, but they're also 
in effect, categories of people. Right. So there are some people who were simply fooled, but Shakespeare thought on the whole those were relatively few, and he thought that they were mostly young children who, uh, who might not get it, who might believe the lies. But then yes. there were groups of people who are, there were people who are, who got it a little bit, but who were frightened. Uh, when, when Richard III says, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make uh, a ghost of anyone, I'll, I'll kill anyone who gets in my way and it takes out, some people are frightened. So they, they back off and they help him do what he wants. But even those people, the ones who are frightened and the ones who are fooled are not the most important. He thought, Shakespeare thought that, first of all, that it's very easy to forget. If someone is really awful, you think that the system is somehow going to absorb that awfulness and you yes. forget about it. You, so Shakespeare has it in Richard III particularly, characters who see perfectly well that something awful is happening, but it's as if they can't fully take in even what they've perceived, the awfulness, and they normalize what is not normal. And they trust that basically the norms will hold. Yes. And that's, we were like that generally as human beings. We have norms and we trust that the norms right. will hold. And, and we're astonished when the norms don't hold. Uh, the yes. norms are only as good as the upholding of them. Uh, as of as I, any society discovers, we, we've been discovering that lots of things that we thought were fixed and immutable are not fixed and immutable. They just depend on people observing them. And Shakespeare has characters who are caught astonished by the fact that the norms that they, uh, as I say, Shakespeare, these, these are not sociological categories. These are people with names like Dorset and Clarence. Uh, right. and, and they get caught. And then there are a group of more sinister people who think they can take advantage of what is happening. They see that something terrifying, potentially terrifying is happening, but they think that they'll take advantage and they'll always be one step ahead of the, of the awfulness, uh, the, the terrible. They, they, they'll be able to, to uh, profit from it and they don't imagine that the ax will come for their neck people with names like Buckingham. Yes. Uh, and there, uh, in Shakespeare's account, at least, maybe it's an optimistic account, these particular category of, of enablers, Hastings, Buckingham, and so forth, these are among the first to go when, yes. the, uh, when the, the uh, tyrant fully assumes power, because he'll always get people in that circumstance yes. to carry out his orders. And tyrants tend to have charisma, don't they? They, they can be amusing, they can be attractive in many ways, they, they, can, uh, they can kind of mesmerize uh, people. I, I remember seeing Anthony Schur Me play too. Richard yeah. in Stratford. And I remember by the, by the interval, I was beginning to feel a bit guilty because I was enjoying his performance so much. Because Absolutely. I found him so appealing, so witty, so clever, and I was taken in. Yes. And, and it was only later in that performance when it occurred to me that that was probably what Shakespeare wanted. He wanted us to feel the attraction that the enablers and the others do. You're absolutely right. I, first of all, I saw that same marvelous uh, performance. But that performance is in, in an extraordinary uh, performance is also characteristic or helps to explain why Richard III is one of the great Shakespeare parts. You, yes. uh, if, you, if, if you're an, an aspiring actor, you want to play that part. It's fantastic because yes. it's so exciting and charismatic and in a weird, perverse way, sexy. Uh, uh, yes. Even though he's grotesque and hideous and so forth and so on, he has the central excitement uh, of the play. And we're exactly, as you say, as an audience, if it's a successful performance, we're completely taken by this. We're excited by it. Our own sadistic impulses 
are excited by it. And I think Shakespeare understood profoundly that he was, as a playwright, involved in manipulating this excitement, in tapping into this thrill. And I think as he developed as an artist, uh, Shakespeare never gave up, of course, that capacity. That's what he had as a playwright, but he worried about its moral meaning. That is to say, he thought deeply about the extent to which he, as a playwright, was caught up in what he calls Iago, who yes. is, in, in effect, yeah. the great playwright uh, of Othello, the one who is always moving the characters around, staging it, and so forth and so on. Uh, and at the end of his career, I think, or near the end of his career, Shakespeare, as an experiment, uh, tried to come back to what he had done with Aaron the Moor or with, with Richard III at the beginning of his career, and to see what would happen if you created a character with whom you uh, had much more difficulty identifying as an audience. And he called that character Coriolanus. Uh, yes. So you, you, you can see that Shakespeare working through a little bit like, uh, um, oh, let's say, a contemporary, a modern, modernist artist like Schoenberg in music, what happens if you, if you reduce the extent to which you are uh, simply taken in uh, right. by the character? But there are, there are risks, aesthetic risks in doing that, as I That's think Shakespeare right. discovered. Is there any other dramatist uh, who has the psychological insight that Shakespeare does? Is there, is there something that may be unique in his ability to see so deeply and so broadly? I mean, I do think that, that I, I mean, uh, I'm a Bardolater myself. I do think that Shakespeare was, was the greatest uh, genius precisely at borrowing into human, deep, deep human characterological and also larger structural uh, designs. I mean, I don't think there's anyone quite like him, but yes, I mean, you could see, for example, that Christopher Marlowe, his great contemporary, yes. died at 29, didn't have a long career, but, but you could see that he was also fascinated by this, some, what we've just been talking about, yes. by this, the, the charisma of ghastly people, that's the Jew of yes. Malta, or right. in a way, that's Tamburlaine. But yes. uh, there's a sense in which he, Marlowe understood what Shakespeare understood, but Marlowe has, how should we say, less, um, less moral control mm -hmm. uh, of this uh, excitement. Or it, what, what Marlowe, I think, what is Marlowe is pulled toward is something that I think Shakespeare would have understood, but that Shakespeare was resisting, which was a yes. kind of utter cynicism mm -hmm. about all of us. Look at the Jew of Malta. Uh, yeah. He is this exactly Richard III-like charismatic villain. Right. He's destroyed at the end. And I saw a brilliant production, also probably at the time of the Anthony Sher one, years and years ago of the Jew of Malta uh, in London, in which at the end, when the when the Jew is destroyed, the Turks are destroyed, and the Christian hero who's betrayed everyone says, oh, this is a great victory for God. Everyone in the audience laughed. And mm -hmm. I do think that's an authentic Marlovian response. Yes. A yes. kind of, all of this is a sham. All of this is disgusting. There's nothing out there. Yeah. I think she understood that, but I think he resisted it. I don't think that that is where he wanted to go as an artist yes. or as a human now, you being. You probably saw F. Murray Abraham play Barabbas I did. in the Theater for a New Audiences production and, and then alternated that with Shylock. Yes, and yes. I, I thought the Shylock particularly was utterly brilliant. I uh, did too. Uh, yeah. No, no, I yes. uh, he He's a Stupendous actor. Absolutely. Right, yeah.
Well, you know, thinking about uh, what I think makes Shakespeare special, I, I keep going back to Emerson's comment. He's comparing Shakespeare to other great writers. And he says that um, they were conceivably wise. Shakespeare was inconceivably wise. Does, does that reg register with you? It does. I, I see that. I mean, I think that he, he doesn't come from nowhere or doesn't come from, uh, uh, he's a, absolutely astonishing. Uh, but I, my reservation is only that I don't uh, want to go all the way that my, uh, that Jorge Luis Borges does or that my esteemed former teacher, Harold Bloom, uh, does and say that yes. he was God. Uh, yeah. Well, he wasn't God. He had yes. a particular kind of training that he right. understood in a profound way. I was thinking before having this conversation with you, John, about the question of prescience, about yes. why Shakespeare seems so prescient about our own political yes. situation. Exactly. And I was thinking that there are some things that are have to do with inconceivable genius, but a lot had to do with what it was to grow up in the late 16th, early 17th century and, and respond to the kind of education that they yes. had. We all respond to the educations that we receive. So exactly. Shakespeare's education missed out on, a, on a, a thousand things that we would want in our education, especially in science and technology, but it had certain features that Shakespeare understood in a profound way. First of mm -hmm. all, Shakespeare and his world had training and seeing patterns and universal tendencies uh, in individual characters and in whole states or realms. That is to say, the form of the education was to think about the past, the ancient past, specifically the more specifically the Roman past, uh, but in terms of what you could see in that past that would speak to you. Mm -hmm. And that gave them I mean, they read, of course, Shakespeare going to the, uh, the grammar school in Stratford would have basically had an almost exclusively Latin education in reading Livy, in Cicero, Caesar, Lucan. And those are, they read those texts all as a way of trying to understand how they could speak to us. Now, yes. they, they needed to do that because they couldn't speak about their own world. They could say nothing about the local magnate, the, the, the tyrant of the neighborhood, let alone anyone in the larger state. So they had to keep their mouth shut, but they could think deeply about what they could see in the ancient texts that they were reading. And Shakespeare, of course, did this to an inconceivably intense degree in characters yes. like Macbeth and uh, Lear uh, and uh, Coriolanus and Caesar and so forth. And then they were heirs to all of, Shakespeare was an heir to Machiavelli, as Marlowe was an heir to Machiavelli, right. not Machiavelli, mm -hmm. only the, the, the scary bogeyman from the period, but Machiavelli, the profound thinker about how politics actually really work. And yes. Shakespeare understood in a profound way what it was, what Machiavelli understood about, uh, about how societies are organized, what kinds of lies people tell in order to, in order to deceive others, but also just in order to keep going. Yes. And then finally, perhaps, um, Shakespeare and his world lived, they lived, Shakespeare lived in a world in which there were no checks and balances of the kind that we rely on. It turns out our relying on them is not as comfortable as we thought it was. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there are situations we've all discovered that the things we thought would restrain certain kinds of behaviors are only as good as people actually calling, uh, calling uh, up their own moral strength to, to resist them. But nonetheless, we have structurally in our American constitution built in checks and balances that Shakespeare's world had no notion of whatsoever. And what that meant was that they were incredibly sensitive to uh, the possibility of tyranny. Yes. Uh, to what would happen 
when someone began to move in a direction toward tyranny. That's after all, also Machiavelli wasn't speaking only against it, but Machiavelli, that's Machiavelli sensitivity as well. What that's does it right. mean? What kinds of moves do people make? Yes. And you can see that one of the reasons that Shakespeare seems so prescient for our world, the world of Putin and Duterte and Orban right. and all the rest of them, including perhaps our own, uh, is that uh, he just could detect, he's like a kind of seismograph that was unbelievably sensitive to when things are moving, when the yes. dial is moving in that direction. Yes. And you know, I think that's one of the, one of the major contributions that you have made, that you are teaching us to be prescient. Is that, uh, is that something that um, you try to inculcate in your students as well? Is that, is that a, a value that you feel is important in uh, a humanities curriculum? I do think that I'm myself uh, not inclined in my teaching uh, to, conf to make political statements about the here and now. I think I can do that as a citizen if I want to do it, uh, but I don't think it's myself, my, my role as a, uh, as a teacher uh, to do it. But I do think it's my role as a teacher to create, uh, in, insofar as I can, to help to create an educated, critical intelligence, an educated citizen, uh, yes. someone who actually uh, knows how to look uh, past the public statements, the immediate uh, claims, the lies, uh, yes. that are told that, and I think that's absolutely centrally part of Shakespeare's gift. Uh, there are other aspects of it as well. That's part of his political gift. And also to understand what kinds of characters we are, Shakespeare is a particular genius, but he's not alone in this. So is, so is Jane Austen, and so is George Eliot, and so is Tolstoy okay. and Dostoevsky. What, what human characters, characteristics inwardly, uh, come out in our social relations? What do we reveal about ourselves? Yes. Uh, in our, what look like casual conversations, but also in our, our big uh, decisions in yes. life. And I also try, insofar as I can, to tap into, Shakespeare has very few political principles that we would recognize as ours. He lived in a, uh, monarchy, late 16th century, early 17th century monarchy with no enlightenment values of the kind that we prize at all. But Shakespeare hated cruelty, instinctively, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, it has a particular loathing of the way in which people behave. People, he gave the names like Regan and Goneril and Cornwall yes, uh, right. and Iago and so forth. He just understood that we have to stop people like that. We have to stand up to them. Like the nameless servant uh, in, when, the, when Gloucester is being tortured, uh, who says, I won't, I won't let you do this. Yes. Better service have I never done you than to tell you to stop, halt. And I, I try to get my students to understand why these moments are, after 400 years, still necessary. Yes. Still riveting. Yes. I would imagine at least some of your students have gone into journalism. Would I be correct about that? Yes, just, some of them have. Yes. Yeah. Uh, because it seems to me that uh, the, the values you're inculcating are the values we want in, a, uh, in the field of journalism, especially now. Um, the Washington Post motto, democracy dies in darkness, yeah. I think says a, a great deal about the times we're living in now. No, I agree with that, John. I mean, I have to say that, that one of the, uh, but this is my sensibility and probably my generation and my age. Uh, one of the things that disturbs me about, uh, Contemporary journalism uh, is that the poles have split so much from the world that I grew up in a world in which 
in which Walter Cronkite's slight, you know, raising of his eyebrows or, yes. or uh, uh, was, under, we understood what that meant. It right. was, a, he didn't have to say anything. He didn't say anything that would indicate mm -hmm. that he belonged to this party or that party. Uh, yeah. But it had a kind of moral intelligence that we all understood. Now, uh, the newspapers that we have, even the ones that I, I try, at least I basically, uh, I read and I try to trust, tend to, to, to be pulled in, in partisan directions. Yes. Uh, and you can see certain papers at the, I mean, I actually like, to my astonishment, I like the Wall Street Journal. I don't like, much like the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. but I think the reporting right. of the Wall They've Street Journal- They've done some wonderful reporting. Yeah, ha has less immediate partisan implications uh, to me than, than the papers that, like the Guardian, I read yes. the British Guardian, but I mean, I, I feel I'm reading a, a you know, political party organ, or an intelligent one, but-, sure. but yes. And, and I would say that, you know, one, one of the most indispensable uh, uh, journals we have is the New York Review of Books. And yeah. I, I'm always delighted when I see one of your pieces in that publication. I like writing for the New York Review of Books, uh, partly because they, they let you go on a little bit. Uh, yes. They, it's so, so one has a little room to, uh, to say more than then a few paragraphs about what the sub. if you write for the New York Times book review, which I also do, and you reach a large number of people and I like it, but you, you, uh, you have to do it all in a very, very tight compass. Whereas the New York review allows you to take a breath uh, yeah. and, and br broaden your perspective a little bit. Yeah, I mean, the, the reviews are, gen they're truly considered. You really do have the sense that uh, you get a balanced, uh, in general, a balanced uh, uh, view of what the author is trying to do and of yes. what the limitations may be and, and, and what, the, what the insights are that are, are keepers. Yes. I mean, the one, one uh, thing about, and it is interesting to come back to thinking about Shakespeare and Marlowe and, the, and their contemporaries, one thing about writing for there are ranges of how much time uh, it will take before something appears. The, the uh, article in the New York Times with which you began, the one about not taking the election for granted, I sent to the New York Times in August uh, before 2016. Mm -hmm. And they wrote back and said, oh, that was a nice piece, but they didn't want to publish it because they thought that they had published enough already and that the election in effect had already been, it wasn't over, but that they were confident that the election was going to go where it was, mm -hmm. where they thought it was gonna go. And therefore a thing saying don't, you know, that, that you should worry. I was writing it really insofar as I had contemporary, immediate contemporary situation in mind. I was trying to persuade people not to vote for the Green Party candidate. I knew I wouldn't That's reach right. the people who were gonna yes, vote right. Trump, but I thought, I, I don't think that you should throw your vote away. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. try to indicate someone to the left. Yes. And they said to me, that was August, and they said, you know, I could send it back to them just before the election if I thought, if they thought it might be, you know, uh, relevant then, but it was, so I, I thought about whether I should throw it away. And then I just put it in the drawer and I sent it back to them in October and they published it. Um, but that August, September, October, there were three months that they thought the election, that this was irrelevant. And the question of the timing of things is quite significant here. I mean, in the last New York Review piece that I wrote, which was about a, uh, a performance, a remarkable performance of a medieval mystery play in Spain, which I saw last summer, mm -hmm. they, they waited um, oh, eight months to publish the piece, and it was driving me crazy. I mean, you know that. Yes. that uh, why yeah. don't they publish it? I mean, but and it'll be dead by the time they finally the whole event will be dead by the time they publish it. But then it happens partly, I think maybe just by luck, 
that they published it exactly at the moment at which statues are being pulled down and which people right. are and and so suddenly something that i thought was a, a, a particular subject of a particular curious kind turned out to be relevant to yes contemporary situation now shakespeare and marlowe to return to much greater and more interesting things shakespeare and marlowe lived in a world in which they they wrote things that were generally performed almost immediately after they wrote them because the theater was interested in getting material uh, and uh, almost constant hunger for new plays. And their game was to write about things that are distant uh, that will seem immediately relevant to the uh, world. When Shakespeare writes King Lear about an early medieval actually in this case not a medieval but I mean I was thinking of Macbeth a medieval monarch but writes King Lear about an ancient British ruler from the time of Isaiah it's not as a piece of going back to the time of Isaiah it's a trying attempt to understand what it is right now but with this right. displacement so that when when Shakespeare has a character say uh, in King Lear a dog's obeyed an office you couldn't say that in a tavern in London uh, in the early 17th century. You'd get your ear cut off by the state. You'd get your tongue cut out. A dog's obeyed an office. Uh, but you could say it before 3,000 people on the stage uh, because you had it in the voice of King Lear. And Lear yes, was mad at that point yes. that he's speaking. And yeah. when, when in The Winter's Tale, when Leontes says to Paulina, I'll have, I'll have thee burnt. And she replies, it's a heretic that makes the fire, not she that burns in it. It's a heretic that makes the fire. That's an incredible thing to say. They were burning yes. heretics That's at right. this time. And a Catholic who was watching in the crowd would have thought it's a heretic that makes the fire, not he or she that burns in it. But you couldn't say it. Yes. You couldn't say yes. it without being killed. Yeah. But Shakespeare could say it. That's amazing. Yes. Well, as we look to um, November, are there, are you planning to uh, have anything more to say about what we need to be concerned about? Is, is this well, uh, on your agenda? Nothing, no, no immediate uh, impulse. I did write something in the New Yorker uh, not so long ago by Shakespeare on plague. Yes, uh, I love that piece. And, yes. and uh, in, my, in this vein, I said, I think truthfully, uh, I mean, the important point is to be truthful. You can't just cook the books. Uh, but I did try to point out that Shakespeare's most powerful what looks like Shakespeare's most powerful description of what it is like to be in a country that's in the grip of a plague is not a description, curiously enough, of a plague at all, uh, but a description of what it's like to be in the, in the grip of a bloodthirsty uh, and cruel and also strangely incompetent tyrant, namely yes. Macbeth. Yes, yes, yeah who I think is, um, it, it looks to me as if he's going to weaponize this tropidermic. Um, yeah. I'm not quite sure how he sees political advantage, but, uh, but it, it, it may just be denial. Do you have any, any theory about it? I mean, I, certain things are, as they say, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm more comfortable in the 16th and 17th century always than I am uh, in the 21st, I do think that the recent uh, statements, f such as the, the strange remark to slow the testing, which his, his people said was a joke, yeah. but then he said was not a joke, yeah. uh, is a piece of, of um, I, it's hard to understand really. I mean, either a piece of Machiavellian policy we won't reveal uh, uh, the, the death rates any longer because we won't test anyone. We won't, the, the infection rates or the death rates, we won't test anyone. 
uh, or it's a piece of wishful thinking, a, a little bit like Macbeth thinking that that uh, Burnham Wood can never come to Dunstan. Yes. Right. Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, that the kind of mad, wishful thinking. Yes. I don't understand it, honestly. I, I, I mean, the, the say I find it, or rather, I don't understand. I mean, I do understand a little bit. Um, but uh, if people, we have 120,000 people now, more than 120,000 people who've died uh, of this uh, we are, of this virus, we're we're leading the world, and alas, in yes. death rates. Uh, We've made America great again. That it is a catastrophic uh, result. It can't entirely be blamed on, uh, by any means, on the administration. But the absence of a clear national policy uh, seems incredible to me, given the. Yeah. Uh, given the political stakes of it. One of the things I've read recently, John, and I'm sure you've read it, I reread Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year, uh, yes. which was written in the middle of the uh, 18th century, but is, uh, is about the great plague of 1665 in London. And it's a kind of, uses a lot of uh, eyewitness accounts. And what's astonishing to me about that wonderful book of Defoe's is that almost all of our practices, protective practices, uh, such as social distancing, quarantining, uh, the- Contact uh, tracing. A, uh, these are all uh, already, without any epidemiological understanding, these were all already in place yes. in the 17th century. Uh, and one of the things that Defoe uh, describes is a moment at which the plague uh, deaths lessened. The, the plague seemed to have shrunk uh, a little bit and people go completely recklessly crazy. They, they start doing the things that they hadn't been doing. They start mingling again. They're, they're constantly, they're now touching each other, kissing each other, shaking hands and so forth and so on. And the play comes back, roaring back. Now, it doesn't take a great genius to understand this, which was already understood in the, seven, in the 17th century, that there can be resurgences of this, that you right. have to get control of it. And it, it, it does uh, strike me, I mean, I listened to same accounts by our own, by Anthony Fauci and others. And I, we, we get what we need to do right. to get control of this, uh, but we don't do it I yeah. mean, uh, for, for whatever strange political reason. Well, I, 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 I try to, I, I go between explaining it as ignorance and as explaining it as ignorance. Yes, and I, well, the I ignorance is, that the, to, to ignore it means to be able to get apparently looks like it means to be able to get the economy up and running again, which we need. That's Everyone right. needs to that's live. Right. We need to live. We yeah. have to work, but we have to be careful. You can yes. work most work you can do with a mask on. Yes. Uh, so the question, and, and we know that that wearing a mask reduces the epidemic. So it's a no-brainer. Yes, but. Yes then strangely enough, people behave as if they don't have brains. Yes, that's right. You, and in one of your uh, essays, I think you talk about uh, the meaning of persona. Yes. And, and it's, it's a word that uh, met mask in Greek theater, as I understand it. Yes, it did. Uh, I, I've been thinking about persona, about the whole idea of persona and mask recently, because there's a, in, now back in 2007, uh, a British journalist named Gabby Wood uh, interviewed uh, a famous American real estate mogul and television personality uh, at the time uh, for the business section of the London Observer. It was a business uh, interview. And the interview ranged very widely around uh, a US beauty pageant and the unusual color of this uh, personality's hair and a golf club he was planning to open in Scotland uh, and the 
a, a, what looked like a rash claim that he could solve all the problems in the Middle East. But then the interviewer, Gabby Wood, wrote something quite interesting, which was that she was worried, she was uh, worried that no one would believe this personality if she could actually, if, if, if that she hadn't made up this personality, if she hadn't actually uh, interviewed him. And she asked at the end of the interview, one last question. She asked him, if no one were looking at you, do you think you'd still exist? And the celebrity paused as if to reflect and then replied, no. And she thought that was a remarkable and interesting, strange thing to say, but yes. it reveals something I think powerful about certain kinds of people in power, which yes. is a compulsive desire to be looked at constantly. That's right. A, uh, as, and as, as if, if you weren't being looked at, you would no longer exist. Yes. And conjoined with an, a, an, a, re, a remarkable ability in the case of certain personalities, and Shakespeare's Richard III is the most spectacular example, a remarkable ability not only to be looked at constantly, but to sort of get into the heads of everyone so that you can't yes. get him out of your head. Yes. Uh, that's the genius of, uh, of Richard III, as if the face, the persona, is there constantly. And then Shakespeare asked himself, I think from the early in his career, thinking about Richard III, what's behind the mask? What is there? And I think in Richard III, he came up with a on the whole, rather inadequate answer. He has that, I think, rather poor scene, if I may say so, about Shakespeare at the end, in which Richard says, is there a murderer here? No, yes, I'm a murderer. It goes back and forth like a puppet uh, when he's by himself in the soliloquy. But I think that Shakespeare, Shakespeare's profound answer to the question uh, of what's behind the mask comes in Macbeth at the end. Yes. When Macbeth's looks behind the mask, shows us what's behind the mask, and there's nothing. Yes. A tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. I think that's a good, uh, a good line upon which we should conclude. I know you have others to do. Okay. Stephen, thank you so much. This has been a real delight. Pleasure is mine. Thank you very much, as always. Wonderful to see you. And take care and be well. You too.